myself, I'm Christopher Stacey, I'm Director of Support and Development at Clinks, and I'm delighted um, to be hosting uh, this afternoon's event. It's the first in a series um, that we're doing, um, so really glad that you could join us. Um, this afternoon, we're really privileged to be joined by um, Dr. Serena Wright from Royal Holloway, University of London, and also Dr. Susie Hulley from University of Cambridge, and we're also joined by uh, Russell Webster, who's been working with Clinks in producing a series of evidence briefings, and he's going to lead on the Q&A section in a little while. So what we're going to do first is um, our speakers are each going to take a few minutes to introduce the work uh, that they've done with life sentence prisoners, and I think you've all had a copy of the briefing in advance, so hopefully you've had a chance to read that. Um, then I'm going to pose a few questions and ask them to share their thoughts on the questions that I have, and then we'll open it up to you all. So if you think you have a question for Serena or Susie, please post it in the chat and Russell will be collecting them together when we get to the Q&A bit. So Serena and Susie, together with uh, their colleague, Professor Ben Crew, um, are the principal researchers and joint authors of a major study on men and women serving life long long life sentences from a young age. I, I didn't practice saying that. Um, they have summarised the key findings of their research in a review for our evidence library and today is our chance to ask them questions and learn from them as, as acknowledged experts on the impact of long-term imprisonment. And as I say, this is the first of a new series giving um, voluntary sector organisations the chance to ask your questions of leading academics. And um, we've got another couple of ones in the next few months, and we'll share the details of that at the end of uh, this afternoon's event. So to start, I'm going to come to you, Susie and Serena now, so be ready for this. Um, so you have um, done what I think um, many academics might find quite an impossible task, which is to write a really accessible and engaging briefing in less than four pages of A4. And that is amazing, quite frankly. Um, so everyone today has had a copy of that, and hopefully so you can take that as read. So I want to ask you to carry on with with what might feel like an impossible task and ask you to highlight a few key takeaway points that you would draw out from that briefing. So over to you both to start us off. Yeah, so I think um, an overarching point we want to make from the outset relates to the sort of necessity of recognising that there are nuanced experiences within those experiences of young life as serving long sentences. So within the broad category that we have in the book, which is which are people who are serving uh, life sentences with a tariff of 15 years or more that they received when they were 25 years old or younger. You also then have uh, unique experiences uh, by their sort of uh, length of tariff, the length of the time that they've served, um, and also the, the extent of their involvement in their offence, which I'll come on to, um, as well as other important kind of socio-demographic characteristics such as gender, race, um, age, ethnicity. So, um, but I think one of the key points for us is um, the sort of prevalence and strength of young life as emotions, and particularly at the early stage of their sentence. So the briefing explains that in the early stage, so the first three or four years is, um, is what we're talking about here, young lifers describe being kind of flooded with emotions um, in response to the very extreme situation that they are in. So most talked about being primarily overwhelmed by a feeling of anger, um, and that might be anger with themselves, anger with the world, anger with the system. Um, and also alongside this was a complicated mix of confusion, shame, grief, um, really importantly grief actually, which again we'll come on to. So in the early stages, the kind of acute emotional reaction to their situation led many to have suicidal ideations. So often they talked about considering whether they could even do the sentence in the first few weeks and months. Um, and it also caused active self-harm. It spilled over into aggression. It fueled drug use. So all these kind of emotions were what we call defended against in some of these really important ways. But also later in their sentence, it's not only in the early stage that people talk about emotions a great deal. They also talk about intense emotional responses to their ongoing situation over the many years that they're in prison. So many talked about undiagnosed depression and anxiety. Many talked about the sort of triggers of bouts of severe depression or anxiety. And this might be, for example, the anniversary of the murder. Losing an appeal could be a huge, could have a huge impact. A parent dying whilst they're in prison. 
um, feeling that they had no hope of progressing, progressing sorry. And so um, this could lead to further self-harm, drug use, suicidal ideation. Um, and then a re related but important point, which is what I just um, sort of referred to, is that people convicted using what we sort of term joint enterprise, that's not sort of the right legal term, but it's a term that lots of people understand. So people who are considered secondary parties to the murder, so they didn't commit the murder themselves, but they were considered to have maybe assisted and encouraged it or foreseen that it might happen. They also receive a conviction murder, also receive a life sentence. And so for these people, anger at their start of their sentence and often throughout was fueled by a sense of injustice about not only the length of the sentence that they'd received, but primarily about being labelled a murderer when you haven't actually committed the, uh, the murder itself. So it meant that the basis of their very long in term imprisonment felt deeply illegitimate. Um, this is particularly the case for women who um, are often secondary parties to murder carried out by their intimate partners who, who might have uh, coercively controlled and uh, been violent towards them. So it was a particularly complicated situation for them coming to terms with the fact that they had been at the scene of, a, of violence committed by somebody who had already been very violent to them and they had particular concerns about um, being around. Um, in one of the papers that we've written, we talk about how men and women convicted as secondary parties in this way come to make sense of their conviction in order to cope. So, for example, they might see that it's karma for all the other things they've done in their lives before that. Um, but it generates a particular challenge for lifers in terms of how they walk the fine line between refusing to kind of morally accept that they're murderers, whilst also accepting responsibility for any actions they did take at the offence in a way that satisfies the requirements for things like moving through their sentence or gaining parole. So I think that's one of the key points. Serena's going to mention um, one or two others, I think. Yeah, so thanks, Susie. So I think <clears throat> along with uh, emotions, and I guess actually emotions is bound up with kind of everything that we're that we're talking about, really. Um, we want to give a bit more kind of depth and nuance to the uh, the points we mentioned about hope and hopelessness. So it's something we're expanding on at the moment in a paper we're writing and it going back into the field as we are at the moment, um, eight years on from our original interviews, it seems really kind of salient thinking about these things. So um, hope, as Susie said, is one of these things that is differentiated by kind of sentence stage or the point um, you were along in your tariff, as well as kind of all those other intersecting factors. And, um, you know, hope uh, was hard to come by in the early stage, young people facing minimum tariffs that might have been longer uh, than they than they'd lived to that point. Um, and often uh, the, the one root of hope in that in that kind of point was uh, often appeal um, that offered this, this, this glimmer of, of escape on the horizon that otherwise didn't seem possible. Um, I think the flip side to that was of course that, as Susie noted, once the appeal um, was almost inevitably unsuccessful, um, it was a significant low point um, which could manifest itself in kind of fighting, um, substance use, um, suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts in some cases. Um, at the midpoint of the uh, the tariff, I guess hope was a little bit different. The, the hope was possible at this point, and it was more often kind of uh, bound up with future aspirations about ideal, sometimes idealised lives that kind of came after release. And I think that while these were really important modes of hope, they gave people um, the kind of the motivation to get up and carry on through the day to focus on their offence behaviour kind of work and engage with the system. Um, again, as the end of the tariff sort of comes on the horizon, people begin to realise that these kind of these goals and aspirations are perhaps not as likely as they thought they were. That can be a kind of a, you know, a real disappointment and a demotivating factor. And the other, the other issue with hope, I think, pertains to the late stage. So as people are approaching their tariff or, you know, particularly as they come past the minimum tariff and go beyond that, hope starts to really suffer the capacity to form hope to maintain hope um and i guess the there's been a real issue around covid lately with the the, the parole process about how that has delayed everything but already before that there were issues around um bureaucracy a lack of communication just a lack of clear routes uh, towards release pathways that they could um you know make make, make use of but also 
uh, any belief in a sense of agency in the face of kind of the parole mechanisms. Um, and it's also worth mentioning here that some of our longest serving lifers in the study, the ones who, um, you know, had got to the point where they were in their 50s, maybe their 60s, had been in since the 80s, the 90s, and had no connection with the outside world. Hope was almost impossible for them to the point that some of them kind of retreated from release and gave up um, on life in the outside world altogether. Um, the other key takeaway point that we really want to draw attention to, and I think is particularly relevant looking at the list of some of the, um, the groups that are represented here today, um, is about kind of the differentiated support needs of women within the life of population. Um, and I think, so there is a link, I think, to our, an accessible version of our paper on the gendered pains of imprisonment, um, which, we, which we wrote about. And we think, you know, there's already so much incredible work that the third sector are doing. Um, with women um, in offending context or criminalized women um, kind of post-release and in prison. And I think that the, the, the links that we've drawn between pre-prison trauma and the experience of um, <clears throat> life in prison, but particularly over such a long sentence, would be, you know, really familiar to um, a lot of those groups. And as Susie mentioned, a lot of the women in our study, um, there were elements of kind of coercive control in their previous um, emotional relationships, intimate relationships. Some of this was bound up with the offence, either through kind of coercion to take part in it, or at least not leave, um, or that the, an ex-partner, an abusive ex-partner was the victim in, in the, um, in the offence. But I think that, you know, a lot of women's experiences were exacerbated during these long sentences. Um, and so that's something that we think everybody needs to be <clears throat> kind of really aware of. Again, it's this differentiated experience. Super. Thanks, both of you. I think um, trying to summarise a few key takeaway points is, is quite a challenge. So you did a very good job there. Um, I have a few questions for you. Um, but before I do just a reminder to everyone that's on the event that there's going to be a chance for you to ask your questions and you can put those in the chat as we're going through as you're thinking about them and Russell will keep an eye on those so just a reminder that you can do that when they come into your mind um so Serena Susie um my first question is about um the emotional experience of a, a life sentence because in the briefing you talk about how that um, how the emotional experience means that um, a young person or a young adult would benefit from someone neutral and non-judgmental to talk about their feelings without their narratives being seen through the lens of risk. And the example you think you give, I think, is of um, in HMYY Cook and Wood, recently piloting a long sentences group. And I thought that was really interesting um, to hear about. So I wonder if you had any reflections um, on what voluntary organisations maybe could be doing more of in, in this sort of space, bearing in mind that. Yeah, I think Serena's going to say a little bit more about the um, about the group at Cook and Wood, I think. But um, yeah, I think bearing in mind, you know, what we've already spoken about and what's in the briefing, foc focusing on the kind of emotional aspects of the sentence seems really important, as like we said, especially in the early stage, but also at other points. So, for example, um, organisations and staff focusing on grief. Now, that seems like quite a complicated and potentially uh, controversial point. And it might seem perverse to suggest that the person who killed the victim or who was present at the at the killing needed support for grief. But the men and women in our study described deeply emotional responses to the incident itself. And uh, we talk about it in terms of sort of acute stress reactions to, to that and to the sort of conviction and the sentence. But it means that they were reporting a whole range of emotions, grief, shame, guilt, fear, sadness. And those were related, like I said, to the incident itself, but also things like uh, sadness about the loss of their future, you know, as they expected it, or sadness about the rupture from their families, um, sadness about the impact on their families, sadness about the impact on the victim's family. So there was an awful lot going on that meant that people would really benefit, we think, from forms of individual counselling, group therapy, when certainly not the experts in how you manage these types of emotions, but I'm sure there are voluntary 
sector organizations who are, you know, the people who can make sense of the best ways to respond to these kind of um, experiences. And like we, like you said, a sort of outside the risk based model, which is so prevalent in prisons and that um, people are, are nervous to expose and express themselves honestly and because they're scared about the impact on their sentence. Now, obviously, I'm sure everyone will understand that life sentences require a certain level of compliance, a certain level of uh, certain types of responses that are acceptable in order for you to progress. And so kind of being honest about those things can be quite, can feel quite nerve wracking um, if you don't know how it's going to be read, if you don't know how people are going to take what you're saying um, and sort of uh, interpret it through a risk lens. Just quickly before I move on to Serena, I was talking to a man who's recently been released from a long sentence and he also explained how much he would have appreciated talking to someone around the time of his pre-parole uh, pre sift and his parole, so much later, you know, in the sentence than we tend to have been talking about. So someone uh, that he felt he could trust um, who weren't reading his words through a risk lens um, and weren't noting down the things that he was going to say to report back to parole. Um, he described this period as extremely stressful. This is something that Serena uh, was talking about in terms of hope as well, and we talk about in the hope paper. So this sort of anxiety that um, that surrounds that period of time of trying to get parole, trying to get out. And um, this sort of anxiety affected his behaviour. And what he was saying was that if he had a safe and trusted outlet for discussions about how he was feeling, then perhaps um, you know, the kind of the impact on his behaviour might have been much less. Serena. Thank you. I think picking up on what Susie said about grief, um, we uh, so many individuals that we spoke to in that first study talked about experiences of bereavement and, you know, they were bereavement that bereavements that happened in their, um, their pre-prison lives, the bereavement that was associated with the grief of the offence. Um, but I think also, you know, the loss of family members, if you're coming in for a long sentence and you're at a young age, then, you know, despite the fact that relationships with parents were often strained or you know, problematic in some cases, um, th th there was often a real fear that parents, grandparents in particular, who often would be bringing up young people, um, that they were going to die that, uh, while they were on the sentence. That was kind of an additional burden. And I think that we heard quite a lot about the kind of the crushing effect of what it's like to be away from your family to not only to not have their support, but for you to not be able to step up and support them, especially when you might already feel guilty that you've kind of left them behind. So um, we spoke to a lot of people who I think even those who weren't particularly religious, who really appreciated the input of the chaplaincy department. Um, you know, older prisoners who uh, appreciated and I think were willing to kind of uh, engage with the listeners like the, the listener, um, the Samaritans kind of listener based service, which they they really took a lot of comfort from. Um, we heard some really good incident, you know, kind of examples of people being allowed out to funerals or chaplaincy departments holding kind of parallel funeral services or memorial services kind of at the same time as the funeral on the outside. but. I guess we wondered, and as Susie said, we're certainly not the experts in this, but, you know, as somebody that has used and benefited greatly from, say, cruise bereavement services, you know, myself, I kind of, I think I wonder how much good work uh, organisations like that could be doing in prisons to support people um, who, you know, are often in these very mentally dark spaces um, and feeling kind of left, left alone. And it can, you know, not just the impact on their mental health, which should be concern enough on its own, but the way in which that can really serve to derail sentence progression and push people deeper back into the system. Something I think that needs um, kind of uh, addressing really. Um, I think, again, this just kind of amounts to what Susie said, this greater need for talking based therapies and uh, counseling that kind of is not centered on risk management. And I think that the Cookham the Cook and Wood group um, was a really good example. So the, the architects of that are writing a piece for us at the moment um, in the Prison Service Journal. We're doing a special issue on life imprisonment. And I think the authors really talk about kind of, you know, this, this uh, their clinically kind of psychodynamic model, which really allowed young people to come together and feel that they were able to express, you know, how they felt about 
being convicted of murder, what it meant to them to be a, a, a murderer um, in, in, in the legal term, at least how they felt about the victim, how they felt about the offence, you know, the, the flashbacks, the nightmares. Um, and, and so I guess that there is space for support that is grounded in unconditional positive regard, um, you know, and, and I think that the most important thing, and it comes back to risk, is that that group was entirely voluntary, the participation in it. And I think that there's definitely that distinction to be drawn between the sort of the support that the third sector can offer, which I think could be so uh, beneficial for mental health and psychological well-being, um, which is not mandated, which isn't kind of offence based, which isn't on your sentence plan, but just really uh, contributes to the holistic well-being of life sentenced prisoners. Thanks, Chris. Thank you both. That's that's really fascinating stuff. And I think that's that'll trigger a few questions from people, I think, in the audience. Um, so my second question is about uh, how you also explain in the, the, the mid years of a of a lengthy life sentence often creates a shift, which I thought was really interesting to, to read about. So this shift from from swimming towards swimming with the tide rather than against it. And I think you point to education and opportunities to help others or, or give something back, often as a way of atoning for their offence. And, and when I read that, that really felt like it spoke a lot to the role of, the, of, of what often voluntary sector organisations do in providing those types of opportunities. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what sort of support people benefited from voluntary organisations or HMPPS at, at, at this stage? Yeah, so um, I think at this stage it's about, like you said, helping others, giving something back, but also making sense of what they've done and their experience of long-term imprisonment. So um, that's what takes some time to come to terms with. Um, and things like faith, for example, can have a significant impact on the on being able to kind of look up and look forward rather than just kind of living in the day to day kind of emotion of what it is to be surviving another day in prison for the next year, two years, you know, 15 years. Um, and things like faith gave people a narrative hook on which to kind of make sense of their experience. So they could say things like or they did say things like God wouldn't give me more than I could bear or um you know things like that that made made them kind of make sense of what it was but also gave them a sense of how to be of belonging it gave them a way uh, a feeling that they were learning progressing uh, becoming a better person and again that that links in with education um and um generative pursuits you know kind of doing something to give back feeling like you're a better person than you were when the incident occurred um so in terms of voluntary sector organisations, I think certainly things that give long term prisoners opportunities, as many as opportunities as is possible to make sense of what they, they've done, where they are, and provide a kind of meaning or a sort of pathway to a positive future life um, is really important. So, for example, one prisoner talked to me about um, a course that he'd been on that was run by a Christian organisation, and it had a prov profound impact on him partly because they kind of welcomed him in, they sort of demonstrated humanity to him. So they hugged him, they made him tea. He said, they tell you stories and they're teaching you how to become a better person. So it was things uh, that were sort of teaching him, but also it was the manner in which they engaged with him, the humanity that they demonstrated, that made the experience feel kind of meaningful and profound. Um, so yeah, I think I think those sort of experiences can offer a lot to people who are just trying to make sense of you know what it means to be in prison for so long and what it means to have committed the kind of offence that they've they've committed. Serena, I think you were going to add to that. Was I? <laughs> you chucked me right under the no, bus. No, there. maybe you weren't. Sorry, that was my bad. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, over to you. <laughs> you, you. You're showing everybody our um, our plans here. Um, so, uh, mindful of time, I'm going to skip to my fourth question. If we have time after others have questions, I'll maybe come back to the third. If that's okay with you both. Um, so, I was I was struck by the the point that life sentence prisoners require greater provision to maintain meaningful relationships with loved ones throughout a long prison sentence. That was something that came through 
quite clearly to me when I read the briefing. Um, and the provision, it, it struck me because the provision of, of family services in prisons is something that's coming up for commissioning uh, again to go live from next October. So I wondered if if you had uh, maybe a couple of practical suggestions that if if prison service commissioners were, were, were on, on this call, what, what they should be asking the voluntary sector for in terms of uh, family service provision that, that builds on, 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 on the research findings. I'll say something quickly so Serena can talk. Um, but um, I think uh, uh, it's a bit difficult for us to give practical examples because like I said, that doesn't feel where our expertise lies. And I'm sure there are people in the audience who have a much better sense of how to sort of take our findings and, and, and move into kind of practical, uh, practical sort of uh, ways of implementing them. But I think the main thing, is that a lot of the kind of mainstream forms of family interaction can feel really stagnant and awkward when you're serving a really long sentence. So having a visit two or three times a month over 15 years, it can generate quite difficult conversations or, or just sort of awkward conversations about what's what you've been doing. And Anna Katova, who's um, an academic, has done some research on the families of prisoners and she talks about the quality of family time rather than the quantity. So the ways that people can have what might seem to us like pretty mundane everyday experiences, but they can have them together. And in and in those moments, that's where people burst into fits of giggles or have really important conversations that, um, you know, they've been meaning to have for a long time. Um, you know, they can sort of, how they can be more intimate, how you can cuddle your child in a way that feels natural and um, sort of really necessary. Um, I was just going to quickly mention before um, Serena speaks about an evaluation of Acorn House at Ascombe Grange, in the, uh, which was in the Prison Service Journal some years ago. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I, I tried to look it up. I think it's still up and running, but it's quite hard to tell these things from the internet. But it was a family facility in the grounds of the prison that enabled children to stay overnight with women. And in this evaluation, um, which I can send to people if they're interested in it, um, the children talk about being able to cuddle up with their mum and hold their hand when they sleep and talk without interruptions. You know, being able to have these really important conversations with your mum as you're growing up that you need to have, but don't feel possible in a, in a visit hall. Um, so I think things that enable those kind of close connections, meaningful, intimate connections and, and generating memories. Like I don't think many visits necessarily generate new memories for people to go over us. You know, if you think about how we interact with our families, those kind of those memories that we build up every time we see each other or, you know, every so often that we then refer to on the next visit and things like that. I think what, you know, cooking together, laughing together, dancing together, but things that are really meaningfully connecting people. Serena. Yeah, just just a quick, uh, I promise Chris it will be quicker. Um, just, I think that the, if you're thinking about commissioning services, I think that one thing that's really come through to us and we've had, you know, family members contact us on Twitter and email and just um, the way that people talk to us about how their families are just don't understand the process. They don't understand what it means to be uh, an indeterminate prisoner and how can they? Because, you know, we've got long, long term lifers that went in at a young age expecting to serve 99 years because that's what it said on their door um, or not understanding that the tariff is the minimum they'll serve, thinking they'll do half that. So um, I think and particularly when it comes to the towards the end of the sentence, you know, the way that the bureaucracy and the procedure holds people up, that it, it generates ruptures within family units who say, you know, you said this was going to happen. You said, why haven't you, you know, why haven't you done this yet? Have you been misbehaving? Um, that can be really problematic. And I think as any support that can be offered, again, that differentiates, that, that, that supports um, and brings together maybe via online secure provision. I think family members of people who are serving these ex exceptionally long sentences from a young life, a, a young age, and trying to figure out, you know, how families manage that um, and, and kind of make sense of that. And I guess the, the, the other thing to say is, and I don't know whether this is the role of family commissioning services, but to think of alternative modes of family, you know, not all of us have um, a, a natal family and some people, you know, depending on their experiences, whether that's through criminalization or their sexuality or, you know, their gender, that they, that they have more of a chosen family than a, than a natal family, their birth family. And so I think, um, a lot of stuff focuses very much on quite an, maybe not nuclear, but a, a fairly conventional definition of what a family is. 
and what that support looks like. And again, as Susie mentioned, it's sometimes it's not the conversations that you have that are the problem, it's the conversations you can't have. So anything that can facilitate more private time together to um, have the difficult discussions that we know in the outside world enable relationships, that difficult communication that enables relationships to build and flourish and continue, that just isn't safe or possible to have um, on a line where you're being overheard or in a visits room but you don't want to look vulnerable in front of other people. Thanks. Thanks, Serena. Thank you both. Um, so I think we're going to move on to um, some questions for, that we might have in the audience. So Russell, over to you. Lovely. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Susie and Serena. Um, so much stuff to think about there. And I think uh, <clears throat> certainly that point you made about um, the kind of basic human interaction, a piece of work I'm doing at the moment that it looks at, at a arts intervention in prison but it's volunteers that come in from the outside and, and, and people love the activity and engage in it for years but top of the list of what they like is speaking to people who just come in and, and talk to them as people and uh, who aren't interested in their offence don't see them through that lens at all and they just find that so valuable just to have a normal human relationship that they haven't got to kind of deconstruct or think should I have said that should I not um, We've got a, the first question here from Simon Scott. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read it out. I'll let, I'll let Simon ask you uh, himself. Are you there, Simon? Uh, yeah, I am. I'll even um, I'll put my video on, even hey, though. Simon. Um, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> All right. Hi, hi, Chris. Um, so I was kind of um, uh, thinking, particularly what you were saying around about hope um, and how people progress through the system. Um, so um, I'm doing uh, research at the minute with people who um, are in the community on life license, having been convicted of, uh, of murder and having spent, say, 15 years in, in custody or, or much more. And uh, one thing that um, most people say is that when they're going through the life sentence, kind of from stage to stage, so the sort of dispersal to cat B to cat C to cat D to AP to, to, to eventually uh, release, is they kind of figured it out every time as they went along. And that the only information they got about that next stage was typically from people that were doing life and had been backstage or been recalled. So the information they get does, it kind of tends to reinforce, I was talking to someone else about the kind of myths of the life sentence, and it tends to reinforce the kind of very negative myths of the life sentence. Um, and particularly, like I said in the chat, that there, there's no solicitor, so there's no legally aided access to solicitors to even kind of get that impartial advice about how does someone do a life sentence. So I guess, think about people that I've interviewed in the community who've all figured it out themselves. I guess the question is kind of, you know, how is that still the case that, you know, all these years down the line that every lifer seems to figure out how to do their sentence on their own? Yeah. Shall I? Can I start? Yeah, so, you to go. Yeah, um, so you're absolutely right, Simon, and uh, your study, PS, sounds fascinating. Um, it's really, so at the moment, we're going back and we're re-interviewing um, everyone that we spoke to in the original study eight years later and about 30 35 of them have been released and you know the stories that we're that we're hearing but even in the first study you know in the late stage the the, the absolute fear about being recalled for absolutely for absolutely nothing really dominated those kind of experiences um a couple of people that I interviewed the other week um one of whom was released one of whom was in an open prison both talked about this issue with solicitors and legal aid, you know, about one said um, uh, that you, you you seem to be not taking your parole seriously if you don't get a solicitor. And another one who said, who I reflected that to him and he said, well, I, I don't think it's that you're not taking it seriously, but I think you'd be a fool not to. And when you think about what we know about kind of the, the, the destruction of the legal aid system, um, you know, how can, how can it be right that there is no... Uh, no equal access to fair and impartial advice and guidance um, and at the other end of the system you know we had people telling us that they like yeah exactly the stuff about the tariff that they had no idea they, they if they hadn't found other lifers to tell them what was what they wouldn't have known what to do I mean we're trying to do our little bit for that by converting the some of our findings about kind of almost like surviving the early stage of we don't want to give this kind of false view that it's, you know, that here's, a, here's a guide on how to do this. But this is, um, you know, as you were saying, like, 
um, people really rely on what other lifers say and they, they've got skin in the game and they trust their experience in a way. And so I think seeing that they can get through and here's how they get through, but here's how it's really hard and what you might want to watch out for is one thing. Um, I do know that HMPPS, I believe, were working on a, a, an actual life sentence prisoner manual before COVID hit, but I haven't heard any more about it. Can I, yeah, can I just add to that? So, um, yeah, I think, like you said, there's very little sort of information out there. I think what Serena started to say and then didn't quite finish was that we were putting together the graphic pamphlet oh, yeah, that, that yeah. summarises the findings. I think you started with the summarises the findings, but uh, yeah, so, we, so we're putting together with an artist, we're putting together a sort of summary of the findings that we want to make available in all prison, you know, all prison serving life sentences, but uh, particularly those at the early stage. Um, we had talked about actually, and I think it's interesting the idea of whether you sort of say anything about the myths to try and bust them, but it's a bit, it feels a bit tricky to sort of say for sure which ones are myths and which aren't, because for some people, you know, they will struggle to get out on tariff and things like that. But the, um, the, the guy that I interviewed recently, he got out exactly on his tariff and said that in his early stage, he didn't think that was possible. All he heard was that people were uh, released post tariff. So I think you're right that it's, it's interesting how little information, but also how we had at least two people talk to us about how inspirational it was seeing lifers who had survived the sentence. So if they'd they'd been to one had been to a sort of conference through the listening uh, listener service, and uh, I can't remember what the other one was, but they'd seen they'd met lifers who were kind of now released, and they said it was just amazing to see that life after life was possible. Um, and I don't think, you know, you're like you said, you only hear the stories of people being recalled. So you only hear the sort of the, the bad stories, I suppose, rather than the kind of positive. Stories. Yeah, I guess I guess in terms of myths, I'm kind of thinking about that one about, you know, you mess around at the start because that then yeah, shows exactly. you've kind of changed. You know? yeah, and, that, and then there was people 10, 12 years down the line when they're coming up on a free tariff sift. They're sitting in front of people that said, yeah, but in, you know, 1923, you did this because we know the system's got such a long memory. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, things can be incredibly or, or 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 being told by officers or governors or at sentence planning meetings that it's impossible to get on tariff yeah I mean, it's, 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 un, it's unusual it's not impossible yeah. but um yeah no i just think it, it it doesn't and i wonder whether lumping lifers in with all isps as well just kind of muddies the water it used to be there used to be a life manual it wasn't great was it but there used mm -hmm. to be kind of special services for people serving mandatory life and there's no longer those things but anyway i, I won't take up any more of your time it was just the point i wanted to make Thanks. One, one thing just to say back to you, Simon, on that point as well, as was kind of lifer officers, you know, the kind of lifer yeah. units, lifer officers, there were sort of spaces set up that these kind of conversations were probably, or, or certainly staff were probably kind of expected to be, at least one particular staff member was expected to be really informed on these things. And now that that, that might have been lost in some of the sort of dispersal. Yeah, when you do your graphical booklet, by the way, the graphical booklet, uh, easy read guide at the start of a parole dossier is 26 pages long. So if you could not make it 26 pages, that would be quite useful. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know that it's 12 and, uh, <laughs> and some of that is uh, uh, just pictures. So okay. yes. <laughs> Cheers, thank you. Thanks, Simon. I, I know, as you said, you're kind of embarking on the next stage now, Susie and Serena, and um, <clears throat> obviously that will in include you know you'll see people that have been released and also kind of very sadly people that have been recalled as well um i'm very struck by one of the uh, the concepts in your book of, of that kind of narrative lifeboat that you know the ways that people kind of get through the sentence um and i just wonder what happens if if you spend 15 20 years or longer kind of looking at a an end date that you know perhaps shifts but you've still got everything focused once you you get a few years in into perhaps coming out how that kind of disturbed you when you suddenly realize well actually you know that, that might you know, i might not have crossed the finishing line now um so i'd be really interested to hear your thoughts about that do you want to go first susie since i took no, that's okay time. you can <laughs> oh, okay thanks um yeah absolutely russell there was a so that, as we both mentioned i think we're writing this paper that is about hope in the late stage at the moment and um, there was a paper by Mason, I think about 1990, that said that the the hope that is available or possible for a life sentence prisoner kind of decreases exponentially with every year beyond tariff. Obviously, we haven't done a quantitative analysis that could prove or disprove that, but anecdotally, qualitatively, 
um yeah i think absolutely there are i mean we did we did come across people who were over tariff and still in closed conditions and who did feel some sort of hope but they were a in the minority and b they were the ones who had some sort of sense of um a forward momentum of like the pendulum finally after decades shifting in their behavior um sorry in their favor and i think that you know if we'd have interviewed them at any time probably a couple of months before that they would have been in an absolute state of despair and i think that's one of the things is that you know how how kind of how it shifts um and so you know we we interview people who were decades over tariff um some of whom had finally reached open conditions but that really meant nothing to them you know there's this perception that kind of open conditions is the holy grail and certainly those who were kind of maybe at the mid stage of the sentence were like, I just need to get my decat and I just need to get to open and everything will be all right. And it, and just sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, the, the, again, the kind of the bureaucracy that, that I guess the necessary, obviously bureaucracy, the stuff that is around risk, but I guess then also the, um, the other stuff that seems not quite so legitimate. And I think people feeling, for example, that, life is being told that well okay yeah it's another year but it doesn't really matter because you've done 20 and it's like you know just that lack of humanity in compassion really that kind of well yes it is actually it is another year because i've been sitting here waiting for my tariff to finish since i came in two decades ago um i don't know that that answers your question but um i'll hand over to susie who might <laughs> to be fair i don't think i have anything to add soon enough. <laughs> oh okay <laughs> Russell, you're on mute. Sorry. And you're still on mute, I think, Russell. Thanks, Chris. That my unmuting wasn't working. I was going to say I don't think that's a a question that had an answer, but I think it it clearly will um, be something that comes up a lot in your kind of ongoing research. Um, a question now from uh, Valentina Borden, um, who works at, at Forward. Uh, Valentina, you're up. Hi. Hey, Valentina. You're right. Hi, Serena. How are hey. you doing? I'm well, thanks. You? Good, good. I'm good. Yeah, just a bit of context. Serena was my professor at university. I just got a promotion, everyone. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> well, yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my question was, I'm not, I'm not sure whether um, this necessar necessarily fits under um, your expertise, but I'd be really interested to know what you think kind of um, the impact that your research has on sentencing policies, because obviously su studies like yours obviously kind of highlight the negative consequences of life sentences, both individually and societally. So. I'm quite interested to know whether you have any thoughts on whether life sentences may be less appropriate for certain individuals um, for certain crimes or whether you think that kind of sets dangerous precedents. But yeah. Thank you. I will let Susie talk first this time. That's fine. I don't mind. Hi, Valentina. Thanks for your Hi. question. Um, so um, I think uh, so I think some of the things that we that we hope that the research will draw attention to is the kind of length of life sentences, you know, drawing attention to how much they've increased. So in the last decade or so, they've gone up by 10 years. So what we once thought was a, an appropriate and fair punishment for murder has been increased by 10 years. And, you know, kind of really thinking what that means, that if you were convicted of uh, a murder involving a knife, prior to the changes in the law in the early 2000s, you would have got 15 year sentence and overnight that changed to 25 years. And what that means, you know, why that suddenly needs 10 more years to sort of atone for, or to, you know, kind of demonstrate that you're being punished. Um, I think the, um, the other things about what's appropriate is aspects of um, kind of maturity. So one of the things that we're interested in is kind of the fact that a lot of the ma maturity research now demonstrates that you know the sort of the, the developmental span is over much longer than than is often sort of suggested so there's the kind of 18 year old cutoff when really we know that people are still maturing and developing into their mid-20s and so sort of what do we expect people to know and do in particular incidents when their their brains 
are actually functioning in the same way as they are when they're sort of as, a, as what we used to think a 16 year old would function as, for example. So I think some of the issues around kind of age, uh, there's a lot of really good work by um, T2A. So um, I've forgotten this. Cadbury Trust. Yeah, I've forgotten yeah. this. Transition to adulthood. Um, and um, I think the Howard League have just recently um, put some videos out about kind of why we think there's like a, a sudden drop off at 18 that totally changes the way people behave. And then the other thing that I will just mention, because it's my sort of pet, is uh, joint enterprise and kind of, you know, the extent to which we think people who were present at the scene or um, were kind of nearby or, you know, all the different versions of what that looks like in practice, whether they require the label of a murderer and the sentence of a life sentence. Now, I think that there are other ways that we could be managing and labelling and sort of um, holding people responsible for the actions that they are, uh, that they were um, responsible for on the day. And that that might not need to be uh, a murder conviction and a, and a 30 year sentence for being present at a shooting, for example. So, um, I mean, the, the actual sort of whether we can have those kind of impacts is a slightly different, you know, prospect because that requires quite a lot of um, that requires people to be to be paying attention to the research and to be listening and, and and listening less perhaps to what we think tends to drive sentencing policy which is public outcries and you know concerns about what the public thinks and so I mean we would love to think that we would have some impact I think but it's it's difficult to know I mean may, maybe the with the second piece of research that we're doing which follows people up we might have sort of a, another strong base to argue from about what, what's really happening to people over these really long periods of time in prison. Yeah, and just to, just to add, if I can quickly, um, I think that, as Susie said, it would be lovely to influence a sentencing policy, but um, there are other much louder uh, voices than ours out there, unfortunately, uh, but we will keep trying. Um, we wrote a piece um, in a book called uh, Crime, Crime and Consequences, um, that um, you know was produced between uh, Clinks and the Monument Trust. Uh, this is an excellent collection. I really, um, you know, I can send you the information on it if you want. It's it's an excellent collection, and we wrote a piece there that was about a kind of the consequences of um, you know how do you punish somebody or what should we be doing with people kind of convicted of murder? And I think as Susie said, sentencing could much more usefully um, take into account people's age. You know when they can commit the offence or uh, their involvement in it in terms of joint enterprise but you know what do we expect to get out of these sentences are we you know we as well I'm sure Susie interviewed a young man uh, last week who um, was just 12 years into a 29 year sentence who was utterly in despair utterly lost um, and I, I think that when you think about the length you know he could be given a 15 year minimum tariff to reflect the severity of the offence, give him the time to do the work um, that he needs to do, get the support that he needs to turn his life around. If all those things are relevant, um, if they were. And then if at the end of that 15 years that he is not in a position to be released, they don't have to do that, you know, and 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 that's the that's the point that we're making is that by giving people kind of 25 year, 30 year, 40 year tariffs, you're never really allowing space and time for that kind of change to be reflected, to be acknowledged, and that people could go out and be productive members of society possibly sooner than we're currently allowing them to be. That's great. Thank you so much. I think you might be on mute again, Russell. Sorry. Sorry, my shortcut's not working. We've just got time, I think, to squeeze in one final question, which is um, a, a really kind of tough one, I think. Um, but uh, Cara from Children Heard and Seen, would you like to put your, your question, Cara? Yeah, thanks, Russell. Um, yeah, it's just about whether anybody's got any thoughts about the sort of family dynamics where there's one parent has killed another parent and, and how that shapes any relationships with any children involved. Um, I love the work of children heard and seen, by the way, Cara, so it's Thank you. Nice to be there. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't think I could speak directly to the question. I think, I think uh, the best I can do is to say that thinking about the women in particular who we interviewed, 
that the complications that arise when their children, like depending on who's who are the gatekeepers to their children. So that would that would be particularly relevant in cases like you say where, say say they've killed their partner. I think we saw probably less of it than you might see in other cohorts of women because the women that we were talking to were 25 and under when they were convicted so I think there'd be other cohorts of life for women who would be more likely to have been those kind of that would be more likely to be their offence we saw a lot more of sort of uh, other types of offending or other type well actually much more secondary women as secondary parties to murder um, than those kind of cases but I think yeah I think the the main point is just that for women because it's much less likely that their children would be left with. So obviously we know that when men end up in prison, quite often the women are the primary carer and the women are the ones who maintain the relationship with the man and then enable the relationship with the child. You know, for, for women, it, it's much, much less likely that their current or ex-partner who they have good relations with are, are main, you know, are kind of looking after the children and then maintaining that kind of relationship. So we saw many, many more complicated uh, ways that women were trying to keep in touch with their with their children through gatekeepers including I mean sometimes ex-partners but also parents of their ex-partner or um, you know social services and and what this meant was that there was really complicated sort of messy complexities to those relationships so for example I remember one woman telling us that her daughter was being looked after by grandparents I, I think it might have been her partner's parents but I'm not sure who had kept all the clippings of her offence and then showed the daughter when when the daughter was nine and then the daughter refused to speak to her anymore or the woman whose partner was um had was looking after the child and then ripped up every letter she'd ever written the child and so she so she wrote a birthday card every year to keep hold of it to give it when she was out but she wasn't out for 15 years you know the damage that's already done to that relationship in those 15 years is huge so um sorry i can't really quite answer your question but i think certainly there are just so many complications with maintaining relationships with children when you're serving a really really long sentence and that you know like we talked about some of those facilities for maintaining relationships are really limited and you know when i read about acorn house I, I, you might know better than me whether it's still going but it literally makes me want to cry at the, the kind of when you hear the way that people talk about maintaining those sort of familial intimate moments with their children that is just impossible in a visit hall or you know on a phone line if and, and certainly if no one will bring them to visits to meet to see you mm -hmm. and you know whether you want them to be there in the first place because you hate the idea of them being searched and you know there are just so many complications yeah absolutely it's a it's a, a it's so complicated so difficult situation for so many families it really is Thank you for the question, Cara. I'm I'm very conscious of the time, and I think it might be a temptation to keep people for longer than we said we would. So in that case, I think we better draw this to a close. But firstly, I just want to say a massive thank you to Susie and Serena for, for you both giving up your time um, for agreeing to do this. And uh, from my perspective, and I think I speak for everyone else, say that was a fascinating conversation and I think has sparked a few more questions that I think might, might lead to some discussions afterwards as well. So really grateful for your time and for following up in that way as Thanks, well. Um, yeah. Thank you to everyone for joining. Um, we will send, as I said earlier, this is the first of a, of a little series that we're trialling. Um, so we'll send a feedback form to everyone afterwards. Really grateful to hear your thoughts of how you found it. Any suggestions for improvement as well? And then we've got another couple uh, coming up, uh, one in November on the 16th of November with Dr. Patrick Williams on community empowerment, um, looking at uh, racial disparity. Um, and then on the 14th of December with Dr. Jill Buck looking at peer mentoring. Uh, and you can find the details on our um, website. So for now, um, just want to say thank you all again for joining. We'll follow up afterwards uh, with a copy of uh, the recording when it's available as well. And you can listen back and share with colleagues if you like as well. But um, otherwise, hope you all have a lovely afternoon and uh, see you all again soon.